It is a, it's an honor to be here, and uh, I, I see lots of connective tissue between what you're doing in the voluntary education world, what we do in the world of corporate education, and ultimately with the missions that we all have about competency and performance and lifelong careers. What I'd like to talk about with you today and to really trigger a dialogue, which seems strange with 1,700 people in the room to trigger a dialogue, but we're going to have a little bit of a dialogue, is learning in a flatter world. I don't know how many of you have had a chance to read Tom Friedman's book, but we'll look at a couple of the flatteners that are out there and, and that. But before we get started, I need to sort of get a, a pulse of this group here. Uh, first of all, how many of you could have used an extra, night, uh, extra hour of sleep last night just by a show of hands? Okay, uh, how many of you could have used two extra hours sleep? Three extra hours sleep. How many of you watched the shuttle land yesterday? Yeah, that was, that was an incredibly exciting moment. They had a great new camera view just as the, uh, as the shuttle came right down the runway. Uh, how many of you have one computer at home? Two computers at home? Three computers at home? How many of you have a network at home? How many of you have a mainframe in your basement at home? Okay, how many of you use a teenager for your primary technical support at home? Uh, how many of you rent a teenager from down the block to do, your, to do your technical support? I actually had a wonderful conversation with the CEO of Manpower and suggested that he start a whole new division just called Teen Rental for, uh, for home, home technical support. Uh, here's an interesting question. How many of you brought a laptop to this conference? How many of you have no intention of opening it while it's here? How many of you just brought the case and put underwear in it so that it, it, I see a couple hands back, back there? Uh, what's interesting is actually how many of you are carrying one digital device like a Blackberry or a pager or a phone? How many of you are carrying two devices, three devices? How many of you have a staff aide to carry four devices for, for, for you al along the way? Um, these are really different times. If we just go to the slide for a second, and by the way, I'm only using one slide. Uh, I, I've, I'm on a reduced slide diet, uh, by the way. Um, but if you look at this, and a number of folks in the military are familiar with the term VUCA, um, meaning volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And we can go off that side. We'll, we'll get back to the slides a little bit later. But what's interesting, if we think about that term VUCA, is that that's the world that we live in. And that's the world that the men and women in the armed services live in. It deals with their mission every day, and it also deals with their career. If you go to a young man or woman and you say, okay, what degree do you want to get? What job do you want to have? What do you see doing? after you leave the service. They go, VUCA. The world's volatile. I'm totally uncertain. It's a really complex decision. And boy, there's got a lot of ambiguity in that. We know whether it's on the battlefield or whether it's in the corporate world that we are living in a VUCA world. And one of the interesting things we have to look at is what are the forces related to learning? Because learning is not new. Learning, in fact, is one of those characteristics about our species that makes us really interesting, that we are learners, that we enjoy the process of learning. Now, many of us love learning and are allergic to teaching. Many of us totally thrive on learning but are allergic to sitting. I mean, I, I told you how I, I have a sort of a, a reduced PowerPoint environment. And it came a few years ago. I had a great opportunity to have dinner with Steve Gates, uh, 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 um, Bill Gates and his wife, Steve Jobs, and Steve Case from, from Apple. And it was at a Wall Street Journal conference. And we're at, we're at dinner, and Bill Gates' wife turns to me and says, Elliot, you're this learning guy. What's the very best learning tool in the world? Now, I know what she was wanting me to say. She was wanting me to say the word PowerPoint. And a little bit of background. Before Bill married her, she was the project manager for that annoying paperclip in Microsoft Word. <laughs> Just a little bit of background on her, 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 her bias there. Now, she was waiting for my mouth to go PowerPoint. You know, 
And I said a dirty word. I'm sorry. I said Google. And this was a couple years ago. And, you know, I saw all sorts of macaroni get stuck in throats across the table. And she said, why? And I turned and I said, with all great, great respect for all the wonderful work that, that you do, I actually believe that PowerPoint presentations should be regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. <laughs> because left unfettered, they are the best sleep aid known to mankind. Now, I think they're wonderful per, for presenting textual information. I think it's a great aid to a briefing. But the PowerPoint's not the briefing. At the end of the day, it's the learning experience that happens between that subject matter expert and the learner. It's the opportunity to ask the question. It's the opportunity to see the context as well as that. We are living in a world where our traditional methods of how we thought about learning may not make it. And by and large, a lot of those traditional methods are fairly recent. You know, I often talk about learning being a universal process. And we go back in history. And yes, we gathered around the fireplace to learn. But we generally didn't have four-hour sessions with one break. That wasn't our process. So let's take a look at some of the flatteners, and let's see what the implications are. I want to share a couple stories along the way and get you involved in thinking about a few of these. One of the first things that happened to me, and this was a, about a year ago, I had the great honor of being asked to go to the Middle East, work with our learning consortium partners there, and it was Emirates Airlines in Dubai and Saudi Aramco in Saudi Arabia. And I went to Saudi Arabia, and here I am in a room about a third of the size with 200 basic executives and mid-level managers from Saudi Aramco, and they were mainly wearing their, their native dress. And I'm in the middle of the desert, and I look out at them, and I ask them a question. I want to start by asking you that same question. I'd like you to take about 15 seconds and turn to your neighbor and, and answer this question. If tomorrow you needed to learn something new in your job, what would be your first step? in doing that? Would you take a class? Would you go online? Would you talk to somebody? Just turn to somebody else. Okay, literally, if you had to learn something brand new, what would be your process? Okay, hello, hello. So, how many of you said you would go to a class? Okay, now, this is a little frightening, thinking that about 90% of this room is in the class business, okay? How many of you would take an online course to do it? How many of you would read a book? How many of you would find uh, somebody in the next cubicle or office or the like, okay? How many of you would go online and do a, a search? Look at this. Look at this. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this was the same experience I had. Here I was in the middle of the desert. And I say to them, how would you learn? And 94% of these 200 people said, Google. <laughs> and it blew me away. I mean, I was expecting 40%, 50%. In Tom Friedman's sense, I had a flattener at that moment that they were actually doing something. Just go to slide for a second here. They were doing something called fingertip knowledge. Their assumption was that if they needed a piece of information, that it would be at their fingertips. Okay, we can come off that, that slide. And it blew me away. And so I said to these folks, I said, well, how good is what you'll get on the first search? And they go, not very good at all. Not very good at all. You can, you, you can kill the slide here. You know, we're telling a story here. So, okay. Um, I said, then what, what, why would you do it? Because that's where I would start. And what would you do next? i do another search. And what would you do next? I would do another search. Ladies and gentlemen, I then asked them, two years ago, how many of you would have Googled? And they said, we didn't know what it was, and we weren't allowed to get at it if we did. Now, I will tell you something that that cohort 
in Saudi Arabia was not different than the men and women that are serving in our armed forces. That they are increasingly coming to the table with an assumption of fingertip knowledge. Um, I know there's some folks here from the Navy. I had Kevin Moran at our learning conference last year, and we talked about a wonderful, wonderful program the Navy's doing on competency. And Kevin and I went off, and we had a conversation about how things are different. And he said, you know, we're probably beginning to end the era of memorization. We're probably beginning to get the, to the end of memorization. And, in fact, in some situations, we don't even want them memorizing something because it might have changed since they memorized it. To the extent that they can look it up and we have good systems of knowledge and information, it's there. Now, this concept of fingertip knowledge is a huge flattener. It's a huge change. It's a change in our colleges. As I said, I'm on the board of a couple of colleges. I will tell you that our, our textbook sales are starting to go down in the bookstore. Why? Because a lot of students are viewing the textbook not as the central feature, but as sort of the sweetener. They're really starting with, what assets do I have online? What's online? And if we start to look at learning in a flatter world, some of the things that change in the world of fingertip knowledge is that suddenly the learner may be doing more access to information independently of the teacher. 